So anyway, I uh, thank you, Brent. Uh, it is a real pleasure and an honor for me to be here. I have been in the field of healthcare IT or informatics for about 35 years, so a really long time, uh, and have developed over the course of that period of time an extraordinary respect uh, and admiration for the work that's done at Intermount Healthcare by folks like Brent, uh, by Stan Huff, and a number of the people that you will meet. So this is just an exceptional place uh, and has helped us, you know, uh, both in the U.S. but globally advance our abilities and technology to improve care. So anyway, it's very cool uh, to be here. Uh, as uh, uh, Brent mentioned, I was actually a chief information officer for 22 years at Partners Healthcare in Boston, uh, and so have lived the dream of rolling out CPOE and the electronic health record. I understand the challenges uh, uh, and, the, and the satisfaction when you nail it uh, that goes through with that. Uh, and now I've sit on the vendor side of the equation. Um, as Brent mentioned, I actually joined David Blumenthal at the Office of the National Coordinator. This was in May of uh, 2009. My first job was to get a stage one definition of meaningful use by Labor Day. Uh, so essentially three months uh, because the congressional clock was running. And so it was a remarkable and a very interesting experience. Anyway, um, so I'm going to talk about this topic here. And I'm going to spend um, the first couple of minutes and the first couple of slides uh, fundamentally in the, in the business school. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the business, how the business, the business community thinks about this. And actually the last slide uh, is right out of the business school realm too. So if you have an MBA, you'll feel right at home. If not, uh, we'll get you some credit towards one uh, by the end of this, uh, et cetera. And the basic premise going into this is the business community, the business academics, uh, but also consulting firms, McKinsey, Bain, BCG, uh, et cetera, have studied IT use by corporate America uh, for over 50 years. And it goes back to the mid-60s when the first mainframes came out. And they've been looking at a bunch of different questions in the course of that examination. Uh, one is, uh, you know, why is it that some organizations are very successful at applying IT and others are not? Why is that? Uh, sometimes they look at questions, does IT change the nature of an organization, sort of shift boundaries and what it means to be a corporation, uh, et cetera. You know, sometimes they look at to what degree does IT enable a, a, a company to be more competitive, you know, in pursuit of market share or whatever in the world is pursuing here. Now, one of the core ideas that came out of there came out of there about 20 years ago and was a result of some conversations and some analysis and research done by a guy named Jim McKenney, along with his colleagues Warren McFarlane and Dick Nolan. And they basically came to this observation of a thing called the dominant design. And they said, at any moment in time, uh, you pick an industry. You know, you could pick uh, airlines. You could pick you know, financial services. Pick an industry. At any moment in time, all the major competitors or players in that industry have systems that are remarkably similar. You know, take an airline. You know, they all track baggage. You know, they all try to figure out who is on the plane. They all have systems to deal with when a snowstorm hits and sort of scatters the routes. How do we recover and get people back together? They have frequent flyers. So you go one by each, and they all have systems that are fundamentally very, very similar. Now, they may get them from different sources, and they may find, well, that system's a little bit better than others, or this, that, and the other, but they're fundamentally, there's a design, a dominant design that characterizes the participants in that industry at that moment in time. Not surprising, because they all do similar things. They get you from point A to point B, along with your baggage. They go through with this thing. Now, periodically, the dominant design in an industry will go through a major shift. A re and so you will look at there was an era before this is a design, a shift occurs, and there's a new era and a new design that is occurring. And so part of the question is, why is that? Why is it that a dominant design will shift? And it doesn't happen very often. You know, sometimes it's decades between dominant design shifts, you know, or multiple, multiple years here. So the basic thing that causes a design to shift is material change in the business model of that industry. In other words, and those of you who know what a business model is, business model is basically, I say, I'm going to set up a company, and this company is going to do this, and here's how we're going to do it. And because of what we do and how we do it, you're going to find value in that, and you're going to pay me money to go off and do this. Classic example is Uber. I'm going to get you from point A to point B in a city, okay? The way I'm going to do it is to leverage free capacity or capacity on people who are already driving around, and I'm going to have some slick technology that makes it pretty easy to order and pay. That's what I'm going to go do. And you say, that's terrific. That's, that's my, this is my sort of business model, and you go off, we all go off and pay for that kind of stuff here. 
So when the business model shifts, and sometimes the shift is because technology enables a shift, and so we'll see an example, retail. What retail enabled by the web was a material shift in what retailers do. So the first thing to do in this first slide, here if I can remember where I put that, there it is. Is here's some examples. And you can, you know, these are all reasonably familiar because we all live in the world at large. Retail, the advent of the web, and we'll take, well, next slide we'll actually dig into Amazon.com because I think it's a terrific example of the shift in the dominant design. But anyway, it altered uh, how you buy consumer goods. It altered how you buy cars. You shop for the cars, you put out a bid on a variety of other things like that. So this was a business model enabled by technology, fundamentally. The second one, banking, this is several years ago, where banking was deregulated and said not only checking savings mortgages, but you guys can now go off and offer financial advice and be financial advisors. So you see Bank of America and Merrill Lynch and things along those lines. So they were able to expand their business and do a variety of things, not just balanced checkbooks and things like that. And you can go down the list here, and perhaps one of the more dramatic ones is content distribution, the dying, the death of the newspaper, or the gradual death of many of them. Um, you don't go to Tower Records anymore. Remember growing up on Tower Records. You don't go there anymore because that's not how you get music, uh, by and large, or the distribution of uh, you know, videos, et cetera. So these things go through shifts, and we'll take a look at my, one of my examples, and this is uh, Amazon.com. Now, I suspect all of you have used Amazon.com. Uh, I find a couple of people who haven't, and I say, well, welcome back to the land of the living. Uh, I don't know where you've been over that period of time here. <coughs> so at Amazon.com, it's fundamentally a retailer, and it's fundamentally a big department store. In a lot of ways, it's, it's like a Walmart, or it's like a Kmart, et cetera. And their basic business proposition is the following, their business model is, we will offer you an amazing array of stuff to buy. I mean, it's actually an amazing array of stuff to buy when you sort of go and cruise through the darn thing. And not only that, we will offer a depth that is no parallel. One question is, how many books can you buy from Amazon? What's the total catalog? Answer is 58 million. Goodness gracious. Now, I'm probably half of those never sold any, but you go buy, maybe you'll be the first to go buy number 58 million uh, on these particular books here. So they say, we're going to provide this amazingly broad and amazingly deep array of goods. And we're going to do so in a way that does not require that we build stores. So we don't have that cost. We don't have to staff the stores. We don't have to buy the land, et cetera. It doesn't slow us down when we go off and do that kind of stuff here. So we're going to offer all of that. In addition to that, and you can see this on the bottom, or maybe you can't because you're in the back, um, is as, as you do a transaction, we're going to surround the transaction with intelligence and suggest other things. So you went in to buy the $26 John le Carre novel. I love John le Carre novels. And by the way, it says people like you bought this other stuff. And I say, son of a gun, I, I, you, know, I, you know, people like me bought this stuff. They must all be smart. How come I'm not owning it too? So I will buy it also. Um, and so I go in expecting to spend 26 bucks. I come out spending 46 bucks. You know, that's kind of how it happens. And they say, one of our models here is we're going to guide you. We're going to learn about you and guide your ordering and guide your decision. So that's the basic business model of Amazon that goes through here. Now, a couple of things that to sort of bear in mind about this thing. Invariably, and we'll get into why I'm even talking about this in a, in a minute or two. Invariably, in addition to business model change, you also see IT innovation that goes with that. And sometimes IT innovation enables the business model. Sometimes it just drives it. There's all kinds of cool stuff that goes with it. And invariably, you also see process innovation that goes with this. And Amazon's an example. One-click shopping, you know, a small process, but a neat one. Uh, they have done remarkable work in the supply chain and just sort of getting these things out and distributed broadly across the country. And now they're futzing with the drone thing, you know, which, I, you know, imagine my house getting carpet bombed by John le Carre novels, you know. And come, <laughs> here they come again, duck, uh, another one of these things here. So invariably, you see three innovations going together, business model, process model, and technology innovation coming together. The other thing, even though the dominant design of retailers now materially changed, you see the old stuff. It's not like the old stuff evaporates and there's nothing left. They still have to deal with supply chain. They still have to deal with returns, you know, people returning goods and things like that. So you see the old and the new as we go through this. Now, why bring this up? And that is, I think, and this is sort of leading, in healthcare, we are in the early stages of a very material shift in the business model. And as a result, the dominant design of the systems that we've had, have had for decades, will shift, you know, going through here. 
Now, you know the drill as well as I do. You live all of this. You've seen slides like this, and Brent mentioned the shift to you know, value-based payment and a variety of things like that. But fundamentally, in my own perspective, you say the business model is moving from reactive sick care to proactive management of health uh, and disease. So, you know, it's different. It's a different model. It's also moving from, we, from sort of niche specialization. We do cancer care, or we do pediatric care, or we do, you know, uh, we're a neurology practice. To say, you gotta manage a continuum here. You know, you gotta do each of those, but you also manage holistically across that. So there's a shift from niche-based stuff uh, to more of a continuum. And the third, as I mentioned earlier before, there's a shift from volume is good to volume may not be so good. Uh, and so having high occupancy rates, busy doctor schedules is not inherently good quality and efficiency, those are good, et cetera. So we're seeing a very big shift in the business model. So, and that's represented by this particular uh, slide here. By the way, you know, if there are questions along the way, feel free to ask them. I inherently talk fast, so I you know, apologize for that. It's my California upbringing. You know how they are. Uh, they're the fast talkers. Um, so the shifts are driven by, I think, two fundamental, what I call core, nouns or core phrases. Now let me explain what I mean by core nouns or core phrases. People walk into complicated arenas with a sort of core idea about what they are walking into that has amazing power. That idea can illuminate, that idea can blind. Lots of examples. For example, you know, you've always heard about the old saw, the railroads saw themselves as being in the railroad business, not the transportation business. That's because the core idea was the railroad. They didn't see the core idea being transportation, and as a result, they missed certain things. More recently, what has been brought up in retrospective review of the railroad history is they also didn't see themselves in the right-of-way business, and so they gave away access by the part of the people laying fiber for the internet, and they could have made a fortune off of these things. They didn't realize we're in the right-of-way business also. I have three daughters, 32, 29, and 26. And they're all out of the house now and all you know, more or less finished education, et cetera. Um, and was watching them as they went through college, sort of approaching college. And there were three different perspectives I picked up on what is college? What is college all about? One said, college is all about employment. Okay, I wanna to get to the other side and be employable. Fair enough, that sort of core idea, employment, governed what she took and how she approached it, et cetera. Another kid said, college is all about getting uh, conversant with the world at large and what we know from all civilization. Okay, it's a reasonable idea. So, but she took arts and literature, and, you know, all kinds of stuff, you know, that went on. It caused her father some level of anxiety, but nonetheless, you know, she came out okay. Uh, the third one said, this is a four-year party on the parents' payroll, and that's how she approached it. <laughs> now, now, she crossed the finish line and has done fine ever since. But what struck me is that sort of core idea going into that had amazing influence on what they took, how they dealt with the situation, what they expected out of it, et cetera. So what we are seeing in, and I will go through this uh, little bit of uh, animation and graphics here, and then we'll sort of spend a little bit of time uh, in this thing. So by and large, I'm not very good at the animation and graphics. So it gets ready for some pretty crude stuff. I don't have any videos. I don't have any sound. Okay, I got some basic graphics. You know, I was watching, this is years ago. Teresa, the littlest kid, uh, had to do in uh, uh, fifth grade a report on an element in the periodic table, and it had to be done in PowerPoint. Fair enough. And she picked chlorine. So that's a notable element in the periodic table. And she said, I want to show you my report, Dad. And you know, she's very excited. And of course, I'm a good father, so I was equally excited. Eight pages. I've never seen stuff rotate, zoom in and zoom out, <laughs> noises, videos. Holy chamoles. This is more elaborate than Star Wars. Goodness gracious, kid. And she said at the end, I said, well, what'd you think? You know, what'd you think? I said, kid, that was terrific. I don't remember a thing about chlorine, but that was the most <laughs> dazzling presentation I have ever seen. And I said, you're management material. <laughs> <So> <laughs> you can dazzle and entertain and people didn't learn a thing, but I felt good about the whole thing. <laughs> so anyway, she's in business school right now, just showing how pressing her father was. So anyway, one core idea, which has been central to us, all of us for quite some time, is the record. And you hear it, we're all about the electronic health <laughs> record. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more. It's been the sort of the core idea. And that idea doesn't go away, but it shifts to the plan. What's the plan for taking care of Mrs. Smith? And how well are we doing about the plan? So the operative noun is shifting to from the record to the plan. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. The second one is very transaction-oriented. So here's what we're automating. We're automating the writing of a prescription. 
you know, or the review of a result. It's a transaction that you're going to go off and do that. And we'll continue to have to do that. But increasingly, the orientation is intelligence, you know, is bringing intelligence to the table to guide a variety of things. So the, and we can give you all these present, you can all have copies of this stuff here. Um, so the, the, this shift is what will lead to, I think, the new dominant design, is the shift of these two nouns to two further nouns, and recognizing, again, you'll still see old parts to it. Now let's talk about the record to the plan. I've been, as mentioned, in this area a long time. And so what I've seen over the years is we change the acronyms about every three years. Okay, computerized patient record, automated medical record, electronic medical record, electronic health record. You know, with, with, with it was Siemens, we did a lot of global work, so it's electronic patient record if you're overseas, et cetera. And you say, well, we changed the acronyms. Did anything really changed? Not really. We just changed the acronyms. And I'm actually convinced there's six people in this industry who meet in Dallas every year and change the acronyms just for the hell of it. Uh, and it caused everybody to get all worked up, so they go to the conference and see what can we learn. The consultants love it because they got to come, you know, whatever, whatever. It's sort of uh, capricious acronym changing. So we have that, and the core idea of let's get rid of the paper and automate it has not changed. Uh, and to deal with a lot of issues, you know, you can't find it, it's illegible, you can't process it, uh, you know, you can't share it in a variety of things like that that are going on here. And if you look at a lot of recent stuff, including stuff that comes out of the Meaningful Use Program, a lot of it, in fact, the bulk of it, is centered on the record. Interoperability says the record's scattered. You know, so let's, we got to bring it all together because it's incomplete by and large in any one particular notion. The personal health record, we got to reach out and engage you because we want, you know, your contribution of data and findings and a variety of other things and so becoming a member of the record. So largely there are ex extensions of the records out in a broader set of actors, including the patient, uh, but also a broader geographic uh, area. Now, this is not easy to do, as evidenced by some of the comments that you all. It's still hard to do this. It's hard to make it fast. It's hard to make it intuitive. Uh, it's hard to design something that covers the range of different types of practices, oncology and neurology and OB and psychiatry. It's just hard to go off and do this, and we still struggle with this. Nonetheless, that has been the focus of the record, and with reasonable merit to go off and do this. I think it will evolve to the plan. Uh, and the basic reason is if you look at the business model shift, you can be brilliant at the record. You say, golly, I got the best record of all time. And my docs use it and they're happier than clams. They're really happier than clams. It does not inherently mean that I'm actually doing well under my new business model. I mean, it, it, you know, it does not mean that I have high quality scores or are very efficient or managing diabetics the way that I should be. So it is a necessary means, but it's an insufficient means to get off and get done this. In fact, the plan is closer to being a one step beyond in the means. So here's what I think that looks like. One is, and these are sort of, this is still whiteboard material in lots of ways, and so there's you know, a lot of refinements gotta go on. The basic thing is all people, who are part of an accountable care or whatever you know, whatever you pick is, is have a plan. Now they could be quite ill, and so they have a complicated plan. They've got five or six chronic diseases. They're frail. They're poor. You know all the stuff that you all know quite well. They could be like me, a 60-year-old male in the in the in sort of gradual decay. Uh, you know who's got high cholesterol, sleep apnea, et cetera, but fundamentally okay. But you you know you got to get his colon scoped and all this kind of stuff. So you know we just got to watch and make sure he doesn't deteriorate too fast. Actually, one of the things is side note. Oh, a couple. A couple of years ago, I took one of these things on the internet. How long will you live? I said, I want to know. I want to know how long I'm going to live. So, you know, all the questions you normally ask. And it came back and it said 85. And I thought, damn it. And I thought, what was that all about? You know, think about that. Three daughters, grandkids I haven't seen yet. It would be cool to have another 25 years. And so why did you say, damn it? And I thought, well, um, that means I'm going to have to work a lot longer than I thought, uh, which is not really what I had in mind. Just to finance this thing. Uh, the second, at the current rate of accelerating decay, it's going to be a brutal closing stretch. So I want to see if I can avoid it if I can't here. But anyway, people have a plan, and my daughters have a pretty simple plan. You know, it's, you know they're, they're very healthy. Maybe they seem to need a gynecologist from time to time, uh, not gain weight, et cetera. So we all have a foundational plan that goes on to the sick stuff. And these plans are a combination of medical stuff, you know. So, John, take your, you know, your cholesterol-lowering drug. Health maintenance, go get your colon scoped for a variety of things. I am a obsessive about my 10,000 steps, so there's personal elements to the plan to go into these kinds of things here. So it becomes a shared plan that I share with my clinicians. There may be transient plans that occur. 
condition sort of core one, and a transient plan can be this evening, let's presume I need my appendix removed. All of a sudden, I'm in the hospital. There's a plan. I'm in the hospital. There's a plan that comes and goes with it. Or we've got Mrs. Smith, who's elderly and uh, quite close to her spouse, who just passed away. You know, she's depressed. And so we got a transient issue you know, with a particular plan. So there's this sort of overarching with plans that come and go with this kind of stuff here. Obviously, this sort of axiomatic, but nonetheless worth stating, is that you follow the evidence on things like that. And one way to look at it is what is a uh, population? So we say we have people with diabetics. Well, actually, you know, when you, when you think about it, that's too gross of a category. Maybe the way to look at it is people have common plans. You know, to what degree are people on this plan executing well according to this plan? One of the things that you see, actually, and you'll see it sort of play through, I think, in the course of the next generation, is we talk at times in this industry about precision medicine. Okay, and sort of getting the genomics, but also the socioeconomic variables and sort of really being precise here. When you look across the range of industries, what you see is this emphasis on the precision experience. In other words, learning about you and what you buy. You see it in the retail, so we can target the experience to you. And, what you, and we're still crude uh, as an industry in learning how best to go off and to do a variety of things like that. I, for example, buy underwear every three years. I go out and buy a jockey. I buy a boatload of these things. I get bombarded with underwear ads for the next three months. Goodness gracious, give me a break for three years. Come back uh, when I'm ready here. So we will increasingly have this precision experience that we'll go through as we uh, sort of fine grain the plans. Uh, and part of the planning is increasingly uh, being um, uh, better at targeting. Risk may be the likelihood that the plan won't, you won't fall, it will fall off the plan or won't deliver the results. So in a way, it causes you to sh think about what does it mean to be a population? Is it a disease or a series of people with a common plan? What's risk? Risk is the likelihood that we will not follow the plan, we'll fall off the plan. It's, it, it's perilous. The other is a lot of the transaction-oriented stuff <coughs> should be a byproduct of the plan. You know, it goes back to Brent's comment on, you know, by exception. You know, a number of, the plan is working, fair enough. Uh, what more is there to document? If the plan's not working, we had to intervene, uh, then we ought to get some stuff that goes through this. And obviously, the system should help those who deliver care to focus on deviations. Another focus is creating the plan to begin with. What is the right plan that goes through this? So this is a basic shift in model. And now where you largely see this, the, a lot of the energies of the population health, although we'll go back to some of the comments uh, that Brent in earlier on here. Oh, and not obviously, not everything's amenable to a plan. It's just the way that it is. Um, so one of the things you see, and this is in the sort of population health. Now this will be a, a Cerner diagram, and I'll use other Cerner diagrams, but this is not a Cerner commercial. Uh, so I just want to make sure we stay, you know, at the right respectful distance from that, because not everybody has Cerner. So by and large, you said, I want a plan for John, and I want a plan for John's daughters, and I want a plan for John's in-laws uh, who are frail, et cetera, and I want this to traverse. Now, I'm going to need data from a, a wide range of sources here, uh, and I can't count on them all having the same ENHR. It's just not going to happen. It'll occasionally happen. I can't count on it. So I have to deal with a very diverse set of EHRs, Greenway and eClinic Orcs and Cerner and Epic and Meditech. I have to do this. Similarly, I need claims data because I can need to round out the experience. And I probably need data from the government because I actually don't know whether you're still alive. You know, in some cases, it's just not recorded in various things here. I might increasingly need data about the environment. You know, are you from Flint or not from Flint? You know, or is the weather bad or not so bad, uh, et cetera? So I need this range of data on the far left uh, that is coming from a diverse set. I need to aggregate it, um, and that little wheel in the middle is, is sort of transforming, normalizing, dealing with inconsistencies, et cetera, trying to get it as clean as I possibly can. And I have a bunch of people on the far right who are, and again, knowing you can't read this, who have a series of things they'd like to do. They'd like to sort of, how am I doing in managing people on the plan? Am I, you know, above or beyond, and whether some clinicians are better than other registries. Now, registry at times, you know, is viewed as a repository. We've got a diabetes registry and an asthma registry. So, okay, but actually what it is is a view into the data. Give me the view that shows me how I'm doing about diabetes care. Give me another view that shows me how I'm doing about asthma care. It's not necessarily a separate thing. It's a distinct view that goes into these things. So I need to have some sort of longitudinal, what is the scoop with John? Uh, and what is not being, I don't think, clear, how much of John's full history should be in here versus down in the individual caregiver's records? What's the balance uh, that needs to occur here? I need to be able to manage John. Is John missing his appointments or is John picking up his medications? I need to make sure John's engaged and, you know, as well as we can in managing his health. And then there's a fairly healthy amount of analytics. Now, there's, we call this thing synapse. 
It's a series of algorithms and methods. And you bring the data in, you say, I gotta have the data to understand what the plan might need to be for John. And having helped develop the plan, I need to know how am I doing relative to the plan using the types of data. And it's actually quite complicated at times to figure out whether I'm on plan or off plan. So if John uh, canceled his appointment with a cardiologist next week, is he off plan? I don't know yet, because I don't know whether he's rescheduled it in a reasonable period of time. John's seen in the emergency department, that's not on plan. So then we round it out with de-identified data, which leads to research with you know, figures back into guiding the evidence. Point being is the creation, and we see early stages of this layer that sits on top. We call it the new middle. I actually think it's on top. Uh, that surrounds a series of sources, including EHRs, which is creating this overarching plan uh, that we then use to guide and to follow and to manage care. Now, other aspects of this, and these are just some of the applications, some of which we've listed. This tailored interventions here, which I think is an intriguing idea, and it goes back to the notion if you take a cohort of people with diabetics, is actually there's a lot narrower sub-cohorts within that. So I think it's pretty easy to tell. Let's say take John Glasser and his, you know, managing his cholesterol value. It's clear this guy's a type A, okay? You know, you know, a guy got overly educated, you know, produced a 467-page dissertation. Oh, my God, who does that uh, and this kind of stuff here? Uh, he's overly educated, he's quite driven, and he's pretty, you know, and he's, he's unlikely to be a challenge in managing this stuff. So we ought to be able to take programs which tailor this thing, bring in a series of data and more micro, it's sort of the precision experience with John. John needs this, a different set of interventions for somebody who, who may have cognitive issues, who may be poor, and a variety of other things that go with that. So we will see these applications, some of which are sort of the meat and potatoes of population management, but others are sort of to help manage, uh, orchestrate, and deal with plan uh, deviations. The thing that will also occur with this is moving the population health uh, sort of emphasis to a next generation. So right now, we deal with the 5% who cost the 50%. We'll have to deal with everybody, you know, or it makes sense. They may not take a lot of work to deal with John's daughter, but we at least ought to know if they're heading in a bad direction. We have fairly static risk categorization. So the risk categorization has to be a little bit more dynamic than that. So if we do lose a spouse, risk was introduced on these kinds of things here. Um, if we do see trending up in weight above and beyond the normal five pounds during the holidays, we ought to be worried about a variety of things like that. We'll come back to this thing here. Right now, if, and it was the question raised earlier, is how do we actually handle someone from a plan perspective who has COPD, uh, congestive heart failure, depression, multiple chronic diseases fusing them to create a single uh, particular approach to this. There is a lot of process automation that goes with this. Sometimes people find that the headcount to manage a population exceeds the amount of money you're going to get from a, of an upside on the revenue of things here. So using process automation to say, if you missed an appointment, that's a message to you through the PHR, would you like to reschedule? If you missed a prescription or didn't fill that, that's a message to somebody else, uh, not necessarily the physician. And you can see some of these other things here too. So the one core of the plan is this, this uh, set of technology that sits on top, that has a sort of master cockpit, for lack of a better word here too. There are others, and this leverages obviously some work being done at this organization here, care process models, of which there are, and I'm not as conversant as my colleagues in the back row, sort of two forms. One is in the course of this, you say, here's the plan for depression. And it can be a, something that traverses out pa at patient settings or something that is quite centered on an acute setting, for example, here. And not only is it with the plans, but here's the plan to get the plan, uh, and et cetera. So here is a series of things that you might ask to arrive at the plan. So in addition to this population health apparatus is a series of logic uh, approaches to help both identify and then to uh, implement a particular plan. Another one here as an aspect of this is concurrent monitoring. Now you can't read this at all uh, in the background, um, but here's what's going on here. This is, these are patients on the rows who are in the house because of a heart attack. That's why they're in the, the hospital right now. Across this are a series of interventions and activities that ought to occur per the plan for treating people with heart attack. Now, Red means we haven't done it or it needs to get done. Green means you did do it. Uh, and then yellow says the, sh the system's unclear. You know, side note here is another story. You know, I'll get a couple more of these. When I was 18, I tried to join the submarine fleet. 
I was a bad kid in high school. I was expelled, you know, from high school. A lot of, it was just not, it was, it was a trouble. So my grandfather said, if you want to turn into a real man, join the submarine fleet. You know, those of you who are Navy people, Hyman Rickover was the admiral, and he would turn you into a real man. I had no idea what a real man is, but who wouldn't want to be a real man, you know, when you're 18? So I went down to the Naval Recruiting Office, and they make you take the Farnsworth color test. Can you tell red lights from green lights? Pretty important in the bowels of a submarine. And I started telling it, and the guy behind me started laughing. And I said, officer, what's the problem? He said, son, I've never seen anybody as bad with red and green as you are. And I said, well, does that mean I can't join the submarine fleet? He said, son, the country's safer if you're far away from nuclear weapons. <laughs> so <laughs> I went to plan B, healthcare IT. What do you got to have a fallback position and all this kind of stuff here? So what this really is is concurrent monitoring of the plan. Where are we in managing these sets of people? And so it becomes critical to make the kind of adjustments you'd like to make as to know where you are. The other point about this, above and beyond concurrency, is the plan is not necessarily the life plan for John. And it's not necessarily John's chronic diseases, but it can be a particularly well-bounded temporal thing. You're in the hospital now for a heart attack, and we got a plan for taking care of you and how well are we doing, et cetera. Not only because it's good care, but we also want to get paid you know, for doing certain steps along the way here. Another example here, and then we'll move off of this, is one of the things you say, all right, uh, let's see, John goes to see his uh, Steve Dida once a year to get his cholesterol checked every now and then to get an echo. Okay, make sure he's not clogging up prematurely. He also is of Irish descent, so he has to go get his skin frozen from time to time because of the usual sort of low-grade cancers that come up here. Now, when I look at Steve Dida's record about me, there's a lot of detail that my dermatologist, frankly, does not care about, and vice versa. Uh, similarly, my PCP, Dr. Tong, wants to know some summary, but not the whole thing here. So there is an overarching plan, but there can be more fine grain elaborate plans on the part of the specialist that I might see. So one of the things to filter through here, we talk about interoperability as being interoperability of data, moving data around. This is a piece of the plan that comes from this larger thing inserted into the EHR, the caregiver who's taking care of my skin issues or my ticker issues or whatever it might happen to be. So we're getting into this piece of plan interoperability. What does it mean to exchange pieces of plans you know, across the board? That subset that is needed by other caregivers to know the context or some broader context uh, that is occurring here. So that's a bit of the plan, this notion of shifting from the record to the plan. It doesn't solve the issues of usability, those still have to be dealt with, but the shift about how we introduce logic and plans, both at a macro level, but also at a particular encounter level. Now, intelligence to transaction. When I was a CIO, I went through 11 CPOE implementations and rolling out an ambulatory record to 5,000 docs. You know? And thanks God to clinicians like you all, I'm alive to talk about it after a lot of therapy and physical rehab, et cetera. Now, one of the things that struck me in the middle of that is said, what are we actually doing here? You know, sort of at a very basic level, and it goes back to we are automating transactions. We're taking the paper and making it easier to write a prescription and to retrieve a result and a document, et cetera. At least that was the theory and all this kind of stuff here. Now, there was some decision support, but it's fundamentally transaction automation, which is what we're doing, as mentioned before. Now, there's some value there, and you can see on the far left some of the upsides you know, that we thought you know, were. I mean, it's more than we just made it up. We actually did make some processes faster, reduce some errors associated with transcription, and people couldn't read stuff. Uh, certainly did a lot better job on getting the coding right for the appropriate billing that we did here, and made it easier to coordinate stuff. If you're in the hospital, lots going on, of what's going on? The video aside you know, that we saw a little bit earlier here. Now, when we shift to intelligence base, it becomes a greater emphasis on these aspects here, which you can read as well as I can read them to you. And so we will continue to have to hammer away at this, but there will be greater emphasis on this uh, for a bunch of different reasons. There's just too much to know. It has been for quite some time, too much to know. Second is not following the process, the evidence, et cetera, is increasingly punitive uh, that will go off in here. The third, it is striking to me how some, what I refer to as disease and variant processes break all the time. I'll give you, and they're, they're dumb processes. I'll give you an example here. When I was at Partners, and we had a, a group led by a gentleman named David Bates, who a number of you may know of, et cetera, who would study processes and say, what's wrong, what breaks here? Remember one of his team looking at failure to follow up on abnormal results, which was the largest single category of malpractice exposure we had amongst the Harvard Teaching Hospital, the biggest amount of money out the door. It was also some of the biggest horror shows that you can imagine, you know. And so, you know, we looked at, or they looked at, failure to follow up on marginally abnormal mammograms or pap smears, where the result came back as marginally abnormal and nothing happened. I mean, nothing happened. 
Now you all know the drill. You know, there should be some follow-up a little bit later to say are we heading in a good direction or a bad direction. What happens when that doesn't happen? Stage three, stage four cervical cancer is what happens. This was just real horror shows that came through with this kind of stuff. Why did this happen? Average PCP was getting 150 test results in the paper system a day. Surprise, things fall through the cracks. Surprise, they get tired you know, and miss certain things, et cetera. So you have this process called follow-up and abnormal result, which is dumber than dumb, and people are getting hurt because of this thing here. So one of the things that, you know, an intelligence, you know, above and beyond too much to know, evidence is, you know, failure to drift away is, is probably, but these processes, as Brendan's pointed out, are really problematic. So a basic form of intelligence, which is really quite simple for this system to do. Systems are, computers are very good at picking up abnormal results. Numbers too high, numbers too low. We're, you know, phrases in the text that say, you know, I, I had to set a flag. Computer sets a flag. It says, three months later, I had better see a follow-up result. It wakes up three months later, says, I don't see a follow-up result. And so it sends a message to the woman's physician, and if he or she doesn't respond, it moves it up the chain and says, deal with it. Um, and someone will say, I will deal with it. And then the machine goes to sleep, wakes up two weeks later, say, did they? you know, to go off and do this. And you can have remarkable process type stuff, et cetera. Now we in this industry have had a lot more experience, although it's been over time, in addressing this area than with the, the plan here. And a couple of examples, and some of which I think are probably in the records that you use. You know, basic knowledge-driven documentation. So we're doing a little bit of history here. Uh, obviously this, this circle, the person says, I'm a smoke every day. It elaborates, what is it that you smoke? Uh, and then it elaborates a little bit further to get sort of the pack years. You know, sort, of, sort of taking basic logic and expanding you know, the documentation to capture and not wasting time if it's not uh, relevant here. Another types of things, and this is stuff we're working on, but so are others, is can we use the system to help uh, suggest possible diagnosis? You know, and it's sort of the holy grail of healthcare IT for many, many years is sort of the assistance in the differential diagnosis. And, you know, to, to do that. And to also to, you know, to sort of suggest things, a test that might rule it in or rule it out, and to use some uh, sets of uh, uh, commercial offerings to assist in diagnosis. But the beginning of seeing can we do diagnostic assistance that we'll go through here. Now, one thing that I've noticed in, in sort of philosophy on dealing with guidance, you know, and guidance of challenging an order or guidance of this that, and the other. What long ago realized is that there's a whole bunch of medicine which you cannot be precise about the actual path that needs to be followed. You know, it's sort of, it's more ad hoc, you know, as we learn and we go this, that, and the other. But what you can do is set boundaries to say, I don't care, I'm, I'm silent on some of this variability, but you better not cross the boundary. You better not give a drug combination that is lethal. You just better not do that. And it's really not smart to order an antibiotic when the culture results suggest that it won't, you know, won't be responsive here, uh, et cetera. So part of this is not necessarily getting it all the way algorithmically programmed. It's just narrowing the boundaries, you know, and sort of pe keeping people away from either decisions or this and the other that are really far afield. And over time, the boundaries get narrower. We never get fully prescriptive in the middle. Here's another one, which is to say, all right, you've arrived at a diagnosis. Can we suggest different ways to treat? And this goes back to some of the work that uh, you'll hear more about tomorrow, which is you kick in a care process model. It says, here's a particular way to approach this. Uh, and the care process models can also help you arrive at diagnosis. In addition to that, in addition to having documentation that morphs, uh, and frankly, I think in the future we will see, right now a lot of documentation is fairly static. This is what you document on a well baby visit. This is what you document for a diabetic, et cetera. Is the documentation will morph based on context. It says, listen, you know, we really need to document this. You can ignore that, et cetera. And so the documentation will become quite dynamic. And you saw a glimmer of that uh, in the other thing here. Now, in addition to sort of documentation and helping clinicians arrive at this call versus that call, this treatment versus that treatment, is this notion of, and this goes back to the adverse uh, failure follow-up on abnormal results, is the system is watching activity and looking for something that suggests pattern problems. It could be a very simple one. Um, that The culture result came back wrong antibiotic. Okay, I just ought to tell you that. It's sort of a very simple Boolean activity here. Here, it's looking for correlation of multiple events. It says, okay, I see a diabetes finding, I see a high LDL, and I don't see a follow-up visit here. So I see multiple findings correlated, and I'm going to send a message here. Here, it says, I see uh, three uh, MRSA positives in the last 48 hours in the hospital. I better let the infectious disease guys know. We may have an issue here. So it's monitoring. It's sort of watching activity, waiting for pattern deviations. A should, B should follow A, but it didn't in this case. Or it should only be one hour apart, but it was three that's going on here. And we'll see a little bit later of that here. This is an example. And you, again, you can't read uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, 
sometimes think CIOs purposely go out of their way to create. I'm a former CIO. You know, slides that are indecipherable. Uh, it's just kind of what we do. I don't know. We get trained to do that. But anyway, um, you again will get copies. And this is a, an example of a, obs a system waiting and for messages that indicate uh, we have sepsis on the patient. And when you get a chance to look at it, you'll see the sort of logic train that goes into that uh, and watches it. So a class of intelligence is just observation and watching. Another class, and sometimes we call these things in the industry predictive algorithms, I actually think they're more like categorization algorithms. So it says, we're going to discharge Mrs. Smith. And Mrs. Smith uh, could go to a variety of locations here, depending on the needs Mrs. Smith has to happen. And what they did is, here's the, what, what the actual decisions from one of our customers and where they sent their patients here. We then ran through the algorithm and said, would the algorithm support that? It would say, that's the right call. And you can see there are shifts. The algorithm says that sometimes we're sending them to a higher skill facility than we really need to. And sometimes we're sending them to a lower skill facility when they really should be at a higher skill facility. And you can see the changes that occur. You know, an aggregate of 30% of the decisions were changed, you know, up and down. Obviously more effective, more efficient, better care, et cetera. So another category of intelligence is bringing in these types of algorithms which assist and sort of guide the human decision maker and all the frailties that they might have. Another, and this is mentioned by colleagues in the back, a little bit of interchange, whether between Epic and Cern and others, is the ability to open up the system for others to write stuff on top of it, sort of like the iPhone and its ecosystem. You follow the rules, you can write stuff and place it on the iPhone. And there's this emerging set and stands in the, you know, very central to a lot of the national discussions of creating APIs that allow people to write stuff. What will fundamentally be the core use of this is people coming out with very targeted, very nicely done decision aids, you know, to help intelligence. So this is one developed by Geisinger to look, help make decisions about rheumatology care. Uh, other charts of growth charts, et cetera, that have come out, there's an ecosystem, and actually several hundred of these sort of bolt-ons, for lack of a better word, that introduce intelligence uh, by people who are uh, quite good, not only at sort of defining the right logic, but presenting it in a very nice way. The last category, and you see the sort of diversity of intelligence here, has to do with the, nation, the notion of big data. Um, now, big data is, you know, I think it's got a lot of hype, but there's a there there in a very significant way, and I think we're beginning to learn about how best to do this thing. I'll give you an example, a more recent one. You, you all know about Walgreens. You know who Walgreens is. I don't know whether you saw Walgreens' efforts to buy WebMD. Why is Walgreens trying to buy WebMD? Walgreens' view of the world is as we all get older, you know, we get into, like me, into the, you know, the older years, et cetera, increasingly we're confronting health issues. And they and, but we also have discretionary income. And so they want to tap into people like me. They want me going to Walgreens as my healthcare stop, short of my clinical team, you know, for my you know, uh, yoga injuries, injuries. I took yoga for the first time last weekend. I'm not sure I survived the cl second class, but whatever, I took it, uh, but it hurts. Uh, and so, you know, going and learning how to loosen up and a variety of things here. So Walgreens wants to cater to people like me. That's why they have sort of in-store in clinics, why they do prescription drugs, et cetera. They bought or are trying to buy WebMD to get more information about me and what issues am I looking for on the internet? What am I searching for? And a variety of things like that. What am I buying out there that they could supplant, et cetera? It's an example of data broadening, you know, of using big data, not just in store. What do we know about John because he's got his Walmart or Walgreens card, but what are we learning about his search patterns, et cetera? So a couple of examples here, and this is some work done at Siemens. And to look at the ROC curve associated with diagnostic calls for certain types of cancer. And what you see is if, if we just use EHR data, excuse the colors, this is the sort of ROC curve. If we add the image, this is what we get. And if we add molecular medicine data, then we get a little bit further. So bring together very different types of data to improve the ability to you know, sort of guide diagnostic and therapeutic calls. This is one of my favorites. This was done by a guy named John Brownstein at Partners a couple of years ago, picking up the Vioxx signal you know, in our data, out of the Brigham and Women's and Mass General emergency room data where the admit diagnosis is heart attack, confirmed heart attack. You can see the baseline rate normalize kind of what you would expect here, and then you see it jump uh, and stay elevated for four years. And I remember showing this to the partners board and the chairman said, shit, and I think that's exactly the right reaction. Well, because for four years this went on. You know, and, and, you know and, and you could have picked up on confidence intervals way down here. You know, you, and you, maybe you couldn't be definitive about pulling it, but you certainly have a canary in the mind. Now, what can be done? Now, the concern is you knew what to look for. Fair enough. 
But the FDA has certain de designated medical events that they look for when they look for trouble. They look for death, they look for stroke, they look for abnormal waveforms, et cetera. You can, if you say, I'm gonna start prescribing a drug, okay, I'm gonna turn it on and watch for an elevated incidence of those signals relative to other people. I can create cohorts in silico in the data. These people are taking the drug, these people are not. And I'm gonna roll it forward for a couple of months and to see whether I pick up separation, you know, based on these kind of events. And if I do, I got a problem, or at least need investigation here. Similar type of thing of looking at relative risk of cardiovascular events given to different drugs, uh, given to diabetics. So the point being is, I think we will see as part of the intelligence, above and beyond guiding a decision about a drug or guiding a decision about a plan or this side or the other, uh, and having analytics to help say, golly, should they go to this level of facility or not, is the beginning of using of data. I would expect that it will become increasingly routine for provider organizations to say, I'm gonna mine my own data and to see what kind of signals I am picking up. I can't afford and don't want to wait for the trial results to come through or for the FDA to get enough signals you know, out of the sort of various mechanisms they have. Now, it may not be so definitive that if I'm Merck, I can pull the drug, but I'm certainly smarter, faster. Now, if you go back and say, how long did it take John Brownstein to do that analysis? You know, this one right here. It took him one month, a third of the time. Holy smokes. Now, he's a very bright guy. Well, God love him. So if he were half as bright, okay, it's two months, a third of the time. Um, but the point is, is re remarkable gains in both the time and the cost to pick up some of this kind of stuff here. So anyway, and then last but not least in this topic, um, is there are other sources of data. What's increasingly kind of interesting is social media data. So this is a trito in which patients get in and they talk about their experience with various medications. And go on here. And they, you know, they give it star ratings and they say this, that, or the other. Now, all kinds of sort of challenges with the clinical sort of veracity of this stuff. That being said, you know, you say, golly, I'm, I'm seeing some signal out here about effectiveness. You know, I don't know how solid it is, but there's certainly a lot of comments going on here. The other is, what are you using it for? Is you can actually pick up, or people believe you can pick up signals, if there's a secondary use here. I hadn't thought about it. It's making their hair curly. You know, son of a gun. There's a market for that kind of stuff here. So it is the looking of data in, you know, a wide variety of sources. So the two threads, the sort of, you look at the sort of dominant design and how it will be different one, greater emphasis on the plan, greater emphasis on the intelligent, lots of ways. And in particular, we increasingly see the convergence of those two. Now, what does that look like? One is, and this is, you know, in some ways you can sort of fit a lot of the stuff that Brent and the others will talk about, some of you all doing too, it's like what's actually going on. And so part of it is the shift in orientation. One is obviously is that the system suggests the plan based on the conditions uh, and based on characteristics like John looks like he's a pretty motivated guy, other people may not be as motivated, et cetera. I'm gonna suggest a plan uh, to you or I'm gonna help you craft a plan um, and provide guidance. The second is uh, I'm gonna reconcile plan duplicates. And I'll show you a slide in a little bit here. This is golly, you know, when I have multiple chronic diseases going on here, the, at the, the plan when they see their doctor isn't necessarily the union of all these. It just may overwhelm the encounter and it may be conflicted. So how to reconcile uh, these kinds of things. The other is alert people of changes that might have occurred. Again, type 2 diabetes picked up, death of spouse, you know, got, you know, wound up in the emergency room and has got a long rehab coming, you know, a variety of things that might suggest. More than in addition to that, I, remember me, I'm the patient, I may not like this plan. I'm not doing this plan. I know I, I like being, you know, uh, sort of showing the good life and, you know, and all that that implies. So having a BMI of 35 works for me, uh, et cetera. So plans are negotiated, et cetera. And the other is obviously a series of logic, whether it's getting you to the right nursing home that will go through this uh, activity and whether it is suggesting that, John, it is time to you know, um, you know, go get your colon scope or a variety of other things that go with that, suggesting actions on the part of all. The other is, con is contextualizing the plan. Is if you go to my dermatologist, what does she need to know, you know in terms of the plan or the nurse practitioner in the clinic and providing that context? And then obviously sort of tailoring certain, it tailors documentation, documentation morphs uh, and is, a, uh, is uh, altered by the plan. And then we'll round this thing up with supporting care coordination and management process across roles and venues um, to do this. Now, a couple of slides and I wanna make sure I'm mindful of your time. 
and all this stuff, and there's probably only so much of this you can handle in a brief period of time here, is when you approach this, and part of the next series of slides is say there's some very deep changes that go under the EHR. And this sort of, and this is part of, I think, the challenge for a lot of the vendors is how do I move from one dominant design to the next? and make the necessary changes in a way, it's like pulling the carpet from underneath a cocktail party without anybody noticing. And so there's some complexities to introducing these deep changes across the board with systems where 20 years ago they weren't there. So part of this is, this is work, and I stole this from our colleagues at Intermountain, of taking in a variety of information and using the design idea of activity to sort of frame how we bring these, these series of history, uh, findings, et cetera, to arrive at what's wrong and then to generate the series of activities that need to occur and sort of the plan is in effect the activities are there sort of the plan describes these are the things that need to occur in orders or in a variety of uh, other things that need to go on. This is a work that Stan in particular has done is another design idea above and beyond activities is I got to get the data as clean as I can knowing that it will be imperfect. Uh, and to have structure that surrounds both the meaning of data uh, and how one describes various things such as allergy <clears throat> and things like problems. In addition to core design ideas, there's also a lot of tooling that comes in. So tooling is, <clears throat> and this is present in number system, I want to create a new concept, you know, a new um, uh, type of a problem or a new particular type of idea, uh, et cetera. I need to be able to do questionnaires within the system, sort of how do I walk my way through the assessment of the patient, the determination of the plan, the conformance of the plan, uh, et cetera. I also need to design this workflow. So, you know, giving you another example of this process invariant screw up here, we're looking at uh, adverse drug events in the outpatient setting. How do they happen? And how frequently were they happening? Uh, and the answer is there's about 14 adverse, the reason for the, if you took 1,000 visits, outpatient visits, the reason 14 occurred was because of an adverse reaction to a prescribed medication. That's why they were there. And at Partners Healthcare, you say, all right, that's 15,000 visits a day. That's 14 times 15 every day. That's a lot of people coming in here. Why does this happen? You know, what is it that's causing this? And it turns out, quarter of the time, it was, you know, we should have known. E-prescribing, drug-drug interaction, drug allergy, we would have picked this stuff up, quarter of the time. Quarter of the time, they didn't take it as they should have. So they took one, didn't feel any better, it took six. Now they feel worse uh, because of this kind of stuff. But half the time, it was failure to monitor what I call tricky drugs. In other words, blood pressure lowering medication, blood thinning medication, et cetera, these are tricky to calibrate, and we weren't watching. Example, 82 year old woman, hypertensive, given blood pressure lowering medication, became hypotensive, fell, broke her hip, and died at the bridge. That's what happens you know, when these things occur. So, workflow that says if you're on a tricky drug, there's not a lot of them, this is the process that should occur to monitor and to make sure. It goes back to the surveillance and the sentinel activity, et cetera. Above and beyond that, other forms of plumbing work here is when we bring all this data in, and one of the, the health information exchange is both a blessing and a curse. It is a blessing in that you can see things you didn't realize were going on here. It's a curse because you can see things that are just junk and inconsistent you know, across the board. It's all streaming in, et cetera. I remember looking at the, some data we had the, where the patient was both type 1 and type 2 diabetic at the same time. Pretty cool. I don't know how that happened. That's just pretty cool uh, that that would occur here. Or gaps in time. They had asthma before. We didn't see them for a year. They had asthma after. Can we infer asthma in between? Probably. Uh, we could go off and to do that kind of stuff here. So what is a lot of going on is reconciliation of messy data. Now, you know, trying to resolve it. We ought to get it as clean as we can coming in, but there will be limits to how we can do that. So intelligence that attempts to say, I can infer what is going on here. One of the, there's an extraordinary, I mean, absolutely extraordinary amount of innovation going on in places like Google uh, and Microsoft, because they're watching you and me out on the internet trying to figure out what in the hell is going on here. So example, I've been with my wife for 41 years. 15 years in the relationship was permanently banned from buying jewelry, clothes, or perfume, okay, because I was lousy at it. You give the gift, where's the receipt? That's the second question. Thank you, John, where's the receipt, et cetera. So I feel like a special moment is going on between us. So, but I still have to buy gifts. You know, I, you know, holidays show up, birthdays show up, et cetera. So I sit on the couch watching the Red Sox game because it's about the time of year, navigating my way through the web. And I'll go to a jewelry store site back away slowly, I've been hurt here before. Go into Home Depot, a wood chipper, she'd like a wood chipper. <laughs> Wait a minute, that's a bad idea. 
Then I'll go check out Kim Kardashian. I always want to know how Kim's doing these days. And then I'll go read the Red Sox. I'm just wandering all over Kingdom Come, desperate for inspiration, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what the Googles of the world are trying to figure out is, what the hell is going on here? It looks like this aimless pattern, but it's not actually aimless. Can we infer that this is a middle-aged man in a long-standing relationship who's proved to be inept at buying these kinds of things, okay? <laughs> now, how many men are like him? I'll bet you there's more than one in this room, you know, or, uh, you know, whatever. Just, you, you know who I'm talking about. They're just, they're sweet, they're nice, but boy, are they they're inept. Um, so what they are spending a lot of money is to take very complex pattern and trying to infer structure in the pattern. This is a middle-aged man, long-standing relationship, he needs help. By the way, other guys like him, Kevin, Chuck, this is what they did. You know, they bought an experience gift. You know, whatever it is, they went off and did, et cetera. So while we go after the structure up front, there's a lot of work to get structure after the fact because there's, there are going to be limits. And sometimes very complex patterns are going on. And it's not just in healthcare. There's extraordinary interest on the part, as you can imagine, of sort of figuring out John so we can swoop in, sell him some stuff, and get him off uh, his particular set of distress at this point. In addition to that, there is some very deep work that it goes on here. Now here is, it goes back to a thing before. We have a patient and we, you know, we can just sort of arbitrarily make up five complicated chronic diseases. And so there you go, there's five complicated ones. We need to come up with a plan that is the reconciliation of those five, et cetera. How do we do this? Now, this is, this is how we do it. We're gonna use generic finite state machine problem solving capabilities combined with constraint satisfaction algorithms make, you know, using mixed integer linear solver. What the hell does that mean? I have no idea. Actually, I do. Uh, it's, it's, it's a high fluent way of doing linear programming. But the point being is that there are very sophisticated methods emerging for dealing with very complex scenarios about how do you take very, you know, five very complex things, arrive at the right balance, you know, subject to clinician review. This is much different, much heavier than doing if then else, you know, as, as important as those kinds of things are. So part of as you go through into the sort of fused plan is this is directed at getting a plan. Fundamentally, let's take these five chronic conditions, get a plan for Mrs. Smith, which is the right balance of all the things that need to go on here, involving some very, very sophisticated methods going into this thing here. And then last, and this is this kind of uh, animation thing. I don't know if you can really see this, but this, I thought this was pretty neat, these little yellow things zipping around. Um, but anyway, here's the core EHR systems, and sometimes using analytics, and they are publishing events. Patient you know, result came in and a, a culture result, or a test was ordered, or a new problem was identified, there is a listening post, complex event processor that's watching this stuff and saying, I'm just watching and waiting to that set of patterns like this, that, and the other. And it is doing some very real-time analytics. New event comes in. Does this matter or is it irrelevant, et cetera? Assuming it matters, it then goes off into an orchestration engine. This is the following things need to occur, you know, as a result of this kind of activity here. And then it provides feedback into whether the subsequent steps we're taking on here. So all of this is implies and sort of gives you, I think, a hint of the types of invasive work that is necessary to go off and to do this sort of next. Dominant design is not just this sort of high level idea. It's very real, uh, with very real consequences that go on to the bowels of this thing. So as we're wrapping up here, so if you go back to that chart, you know, way, the table way back when, I actually think we're, because of the reimbursement changes, the way we're changing, we are shifting in the dominant design uh, because of these kinds of things. And it will be centered on those two basic ideas of intelligence and plan, and particularly the fusion of the two. One last slide, and we're going to go back to business school jargon, and then we'll see if there's any questions. So this. <clears throat> This is done, some work done by, a lot of this work actually comes out of the Harvard Business School and the MIT Sloan Schools, where a lot of this work on this stuff occurs. So what these guys did, two gentlemen at the MIT Center for Digital Business, they looked at, it, they looked at industries which are IT intense. And so this is a lot of financial services. And actually, financial services, multiple different kinds. So there's investment banking, there's sort of the normal commercial banking, you know, lots of different kinds of insurance, a lot of different kinds, et cetera. They also looked at telecommunications. So they took IT intense industry and they looked at the gross margin. Now, you may not have all been to business school, but gross margin says, I produce a car. I'm getting a certain amount of money for that car. It cost me a certain amount of money to make that car. The profit, that's the gross margin. Now, from that gross margin, that's how much I make on every unit that I put out there. Now, I use that, the sort of margin there, to then fund R&D, to fund the back office things, and then I'll wind up with profit at the tail end. But gross margin is very, very important. I want gross margin because I've got a lot of other things I've got to cover here. 
So they were looking at the top 25% and the bottom 25% performance as measured by return on assets, return on equities, a number of ways you can measure performance of financially uh, publicly traded companies. And what you see here is that the difference between the top 25 and the bottom 25 in terms of gross margin, not much difference. And then it's separated in a very significant way. Top 25, bottom 25%, roughly mid-90s, it's, it's separated here. And their question is why? You know, why did that happen? And the belief was, and more than the belief, their sort of research says, it is because at that point, the IT technology became so potent that if effectively applied, it could truly distinguish organization. Up until that point, it really wasn't that potent that in and of itself, it would distinguish one from the other. Nobody distinguishes themselves because they did the general ledger pretty well. And frankly, nobody distinguishes themselves because they get re results reporting up and running. I mean, you just don't, you can make the world a better place, don't get me wrong, but you don't distinguish yourself in a very competitive material way. What happened in the 90s is the advent of the web. It's fundamentally what happened. Uh, and so the basic point here is we crossed the line approximately 20 years ago, and maybe even shorter than that, where the technology has achieved a potency that can truly separate organizations in terms of their, it's that powerful here. Now, that being said, that technology, when it arrived, was available to everybody in that industry. It's not just one part, or not just, it's available to everybody. So that wasn't, access to it was not the distinguishing factor. Just as any one of you can or have bought an electronic health record. You can buy Epic, you can buy Cerner, you know, you know, all of us would be happy to sell you that kind of stuff here. What made the difference was skill at applying the technology, fundamentally. These people were very skilled at applying process change, applying governance, uh, working through the issues, et cetera, and obviously these people were less skilled. So this cycles back to you all, because whether or not this plan notion or this intelligence notion of the dominant design at the end of the day makes any difference whatsoever uh, is, is frankly your skill and your colleague's skill at applying all of this kind of stuff. And so the, the human element of just being good at applying it to all the things that Brent talked about and I know you'll talk about is what will make the difference. And only if relatively recently has been the, the technology is potent enough to make that kind of difference. So that's it. Uh, you now know all that I know. Uh, but I'd be happy to make up any answer to any question that you all might have. Anyway, thank you. I hope you're <laughs> Questions? Yeah, I wonder if you'd comment on what your view is of where things are headed with proprietary versus open. Where you, if you would comment where you think this is headed in terms of proprietary approaches versus open source and crowdsourcing, and what model is going to win out? Yeah, I think the, the proprietary, you know, it, it's as stated as such, the proprietary, proprietary will, will win out. Uh, because the people who say, I'm going to invest my effort, and you could be the startup guy, you could be a big company like Turner, and I'd like to be rewarded for my efforts. And so they'll, they'll protect that property, you know, the IP, and go out and try to make money on it and, sort of, and do that. So, and they'll get in, for them to get investors, you know, to help them grow, or they said, the investors will want to return. So I think the economic incentives are lined up. Uh, both the inventors, but also the people who fund the inventors to keep it proprietary. That being said, you do see examples of open source, which are quite remarkable, you know, whether it's the Unix operating system, some occasional on the EHR. One of the things that was pointed out in the earlier is increasingly there will be this kernel, which is the EHR, which is open to innovation that surrounds it. Now, you as the inventor of one of these Geisinger type things could decide whether it's open source or whether you want to make money on it. Fair enough. Uh, but the point is it will, be, it will be broadly open to the world here. But I do think that the proprietary stuff will win out because of the economics, you know, favor that stuff. Right? You kind of hinted at this in your presentation, John, but um, it's the idea of us Services-oriented architecture for the core of most of what is a, you know, vendor-based EMR these days. Uh, that they'll make the services that they supply through a, a an interface available to app developers. Right. And the implication is is that the core EMR functionality today commoditizes, and that the real market happens around support at a app level. So the app development world. Your thoughts on that? Well, I think it, 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 um, I think it will get 
it will gravitate towards commodity but not become a commodity because there's still enough value add and differentiation of design, this side or the other. And I think but we're still learning as an industry of well, when can you put something off as a module you graft onto the side versus it's really got to be in the bowels. You know, the system for speed reasons and a variety of other things. And there's, there's some times where it really needs to be in the middle of these kinds of things. So it's not purely a kernel that everything, you know, blooms around and that thing is a relatively <laughs> static. So I think we're still learning that stuff. That being said, what's interesting is when you look at the systems that the banks use, the big commercial banks, and you discover in their core, it's the COBOL that was written 50 years ago. I mean, it's just striking to me. And that's the sort of internals of a lot of it. It works. Why would you mess with it if it works? Um, but what they've done is progressively encased it, you know, in other new technologies that allow you to do web banking or, you know, a variety of other things like that. So we may very well over time evolve into where the Epics and the Cerners are the core and they become increasingly encased by you know, a series of technologies. You know, that one thing of the sort of little yellow circles <laughs> moving around, the, you know, that you can actually bolt onto the side. It's actually pretty, using the services kind of stuff, you can literally graph that on. Uh, in fact, you want to, because you say, I gotta connect into data coming out of eClinical Works and Greenway and Epic and Cerner and Meditech, I'm gonna take lots of sources in there. So anyway, that may be very well where we head, is increasingly they're encased uh, by them. They'll head towards commodity types of, but I don't think ever fully be, you know, the same type as we would think about a lot of commodities that are in our lives. Uh, I have to confess, I feel your pain. I'm a card-carrying member of the inept gift-buying <laughs> club. Uh, and you've managed to make me... Pretty... So what did you get for her last birthday? Uh, I can't remember, but Christmas <laughs> did not succeed. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's, I'm that inept. Uh, you've made me somewhat optimistic about the future. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a bright future at one point known as performance measurement. It wasn't a question of if, it was a question of when. And then we got 90 performance measures on if you give aspirin post MI, and all 90 were topped out at 90%. And everybody says, oh, now we have to worry about harmonization and performance measurement because we have 120 measures in the same disease. Is harmonization the next big issue with these bold on apps? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a series of, you know, one is the harmonization of quality measures, which is, a, is just a problem that's getting worse uh, in lots of ways here. I think one of the things we wrestle with as a company, so you say, that's terrific, John. I like the fact that you open up, you, you know, your APIs and there's all this flora that are going on of all these really neat innovative ideas. And golly, there's seven of them that are doing child growth charts. And there's 16 that are doing rheumatology. You know, there's this, you know, abundance of these things. Which one should I pick? Goodness gracious, you know, so are we going to get in the business of vetting these kinds of stuff and sort of saying this gets five stars and four stars, et cetera. So I think, you know, I'm not sure I answer your question directly, but part of it is, is um, we are not in the knowledge generation business. Those guys, in the, you all are, and people at this organization are, but increasingly people say, well, just tell me what, what will you suggest? And so you have to actually, you want, we have, wind up in the knowledge curation business, which is just kind of a challenge, you know, something we're not used to, and still getting our hands around how best to do that, is to curate it, keep it current, and the right of things like that. Yeah. You know, that, that's a, a great lead-in um, to my question. I, I think medical societies are really focused on building um, registries, and I think the health services research uh, that will be done from these registries is going to be very valuable, already is very valuable in some of the clinical areas. But you said that the registries in one of your slides were more a way of looking at the data than actually kind of a different data set. So I wonder about the interface between health, uh, between these medical records, electronic medical records, and registries, and, and will registries kind of become not necessary when the, when the EMRs go from birth to death and, and we can do health services research directly with the EMR data? I mean, I think there's, there's still purpose to register because there can usually be uh, additional data above and beyond what is normally in the EHR, and there can be greater efforts to clean it up, you know, going into those EHRs. My view of registries has always struck me as kind of odd, frankly, that if you're a provider, say, well, I've got all my diabetics in here and all my asthmatics in there and all my CHF people in there, et cetera, and plus, you know, I've got my tumor stuff uh, going on here. I said, yeah, but what do you do when they have many of these things? So you actually need a holistic picture here. And so in a way, the right way to do this 
is a database for which there are views into it, if, depending on what you want to do. So I don't know that it will lead to the demise, because one of the things I did at Siemens is spent some time with the, the Scandinavian countries and the Scandinavian, remarkable registries in a lot of these countries, and absolutely. But boy, oh boy, the attention <laughs> they do and the diligence they do to get that data right vastly exceeds what most providers do in you know, these kinds of settings. So there may be, just because there's more focus on getting it right uh, in the registry, um, yeah, I think there's, and particularly for particular types of research. And, you know, we can't solve all the crap in the data. We'll try to get it structured up front. We'll try to use all this fancy-dancy Google stuff to, you know, infer and this, that, or the other, impute. Uh, but I don't know that we're going to get it as tight uh, as it needs to be for a lot of purposes. Okay. I have a, a question about maybe sort of the more distant future about this kind of uh, medical record. Like, I wonder whether the electronic health record at some point will just become sort of like a computer companion of each individual person on the planet, mm -hmm. uh, where the computer con continuously learns about those, that person's preferences oh. and what they do and what their health is, and then automatically communicates with providers about what is going on with that person, rather than being sort of this institutionalized thing for doctors and billers and something that will actually be something that'll be like interface directly with the patient uh, and kind of be an all-encompassing life companion. Yeah, I don't, I mean, what's, what's clear is we are in a period of IT innovation right now that is absolutely extraordinary and has no precedent in terms of, you know, there've been lots of innovative periods over the period of time, the PC and you know, all the way down, all the uh, Boy, oh, there's nothing like we were seeing now here. And there's a lot of stuff that would trend that way. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> There's a lot of work on the sort of notion that the, the computer is everywhere. It surrounds you all the time. It's not a device that you have. It's the room. You know, you see an example is the car. Your car's got a computer. You can talk to your car as a computer. Uh, but it's the room. It's the walking down the street. It is literally everywhere. Uh, and so you say it is truly ubiquitous. I mean, truly ubiquitous. It's just remarkable that goes on here. Sensor technologies, which, you know, advances in sensors. There's, you know, some I think are kind of neat. You know, a collar that analyzes the composition of your sweat and can determine a number of things based on imbalances represented in whatever you're excreting here. Some I think are kind of goofy. You know, there's this uh, sensor out there as a comb that will, as you comb through your head, will determine whether you're bald or have dandruff. Oh, for God's sakes. You know, sit on the couch, have your wife stand over you. You're losing your hair. Okay, I got it. I didn't need the stupid comb. I got it. <laughs> you know, I'm going to put my baseball hat on. Well, I buy you a gift. It's a Red Sox game. Uh, <laughs> So I think there is a plus. It is um, while it's still crude in many ways. It's you know me buying the underwear and then getting bombarded with underwear ads for a lot of ways here. Nonetheless, there is an amazing amount of R and D dollar and some very very smart people, you know, going after a variety of components you know related to all this stuff. So I don't know whether all this will become manifest in that way or to the degree that it does will be manifest while I'm on this planet. But there's, boy, there's a lot of stuff lining up that way. Um, and it's just kind of striking at times. You say, God, that could be this really amazing future. And yet, we still spend a lot of time struggling with just getting the thing to be usable, you know, and to be efficient, et cetera. We're sort of this spanning these really, the, the stone age with the future. It's just kind of, the, maybe that's the nature of the beast in a lot of ways. I don't really know. But anyway, I think that's, it's credible. Uh, but, and uh, I don't know what the time frame for that is or, or if that will occur. Other questions or comments? Terrific. Oh, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Just wonder what your crystal ball says about how soon will this new system that's based on plans and based on this, these algorithms of intelligence really be the standard that we're all now complaining about and looking yeah. for the next future thing? Well, I think it's, it's not necessarily a step function. You, know, you wake up one day and there it is. It is, it is more incremental, gradual, partly because you know, we have to retrofit a bunch of stuff that's in flight. And so that just takes some skill and delicacy. Plus, you've got to balance investments there with stage three and all this other stuff uh, that is competing. Partly because the reimbursement environment is, is moving, but it's, you know, the business model change are slower in healthcare than they are. So there's not this abrupt, uh, quite dramatic thing here. So I think, you know, we will see this unfold. And at any point in time, you'll step back and say, golly, there's been some real progress made in the year. Uh, you will step back on any given day and say, I don't know what we did yesterday, but it certainly doesn't look that much better than today here, et cetera. What I don't know is if you say, all right, let's, let's presume I'm right, and those are the two things that are happening, and it's 10 years from now. 
who will be standing as vendors and who will not. One of the things that's always interesting in this realm is very rarely um, do, do companies last long periods of time in this industry. There, you know, there are some exceptions to this, but DEC is gone. You know, uh, Wang is gone. You know, Cullinane is gone. You know, variety. You know, Microsoft went through a near-death experience, maybe coming back. You know, Apple, frankly, looks a little wobbly. What's the encore? You know, for this kind of stuff here. So, actually, one of the interesting things I was talking to some people, strategists around in Google. This is kind of an interesting way of thinking about it. They view that at any point in time, whatever the strategy they have is, it's got a lifespan of 10 years and then it becomes irrelevant. So fundamentally, they say 10 years from now, the search business, doesn't mean it's going away, but it is commodity stuff. It's not the big buck maker you know, anymore time. So that's kind of interesting. You've got a company founded on a core idea. It's fabulously successful. It's got a lifespan of 10 years. That's it. And so one of the things you see, and you see in this alphabet stuff, is this experimentation. Well, we're going to go after genetics platforms. We're going to go after the smart car. We're going to go after a number of things. Because at the end of the day, how do they define themselves? They are the creators of magnificent plat technical platforms. That's how they view themselves. Search happens to be an example. But the car, smart car, is another one here. So you know, there we see some very big shifts. And so you know, I don't think we'll have 10-year lifespans on Cerner or Epic or Meditech or anything like that. But I will be curious to see in the years ahead of sort of who picks this up and moves with it and to what degree some people fail to do that and fail to see it and wind up in you know, yesterday's news. Uh, well, but anyway, we'll see. It'll be an interesting uh, thing. I, actually, you know, although said it, I think Cerner will do fine. Cerner sees it. And, and they still will have to execute well on it and a variety of other things. But I actually think we see it. And a lot of the work we're doing here is an example of us seeing that. Well, last question. We should let you all go. But uh. you, you made a, a lot of comment about the next generation of the IT systems. But uh, the, as the IT systems change, obviously the healthcare industry itself will change. What's your prediction for some of those changes that we're going to see once intelligence is, uh, and all the other uh, changes that you've described are, are disseminated in the industry? Yeah, well, I think, I think a couple of things. One is healthcare is <clears throat> a classic example of a socioeconomic good, which means it has both economic motives but also social motives, which means it changes slowly. Education is another example. Socioeconomic systems change slowly because society protects them in certain ways, and there's a complexity factor here. Um, what I don't know is if we, I, do I think there will be need to be doctors? Absolutely. And will they need to be trained in medical school? I mean, my eldest is a third year surgical resident. Do I think, you know, her kids will need to go through surgical residency? Sure, I believe that entirely here. What I do think it will do is help narrow the solution space and, that, and sort of say, listen, there's a solution space. I don't think we'll actually solve all of the decision making, but the solution space is narrower. And that will be needed because of what we learn about diseases, advances in disease, advances in ways of treatment, is just keep the solution space manageable, et cetera. There's still the caring part of it. There's still the emotional part of it. There's still the skill of saying, I'm reading between the lines, and this is what we need to do. I appreciate the computer helping me out here, but you know, I'm going to read between the lines and do all this stuff. I frankly think a lot of this stuff that we're doing now is just to reduce the risk of really bad stuff. You know, and just, you know, where you make the bad call or miss it, and there's just, again, too much to know. So part of it is, is not necessarily to remove the skill, the empathy, all the things that goes into making a terrific clinician a terrific clinician. It's just making it more manageable and lots of stuff. And, you know, think dumb things, like failure to follow up on abnormal results. Oh, for God's sakes, you know, that's, let's just get rid of that as a, you know, process that doesn't work very well. So anyway, I, I uh, you know, I think there's uh, your kids, your grandkids, et cetera, should they pursue this profession, I think we'll, we'll find it still is rewarding and maybe less hassle prone and you know breaking as it uh, as it currently does. Anyway, I should let you all go for the evening. Thank you all for allowing me to spend some time with you.